When you say yes to others, how often do we say no to ourselves? No to the opportunities that are in front of us. No to the things that we possibly could become or that we can create, you know, during our times in education. And in this conversation with Stephanie Rossi, we actually talk about that. And she has a really great perspective on, on this idea of saying yes to yourself and why that's so important. And I think in education, it's one of the hardest things to do because we want to help people so much. We want to help our kids. We want to help our colleagues. We want to make a, an impact on the world. But too often we take away from ourselves. We often take away from, you know, um, the, the things that we want to do. And it could lead to burnout. It can lead to, to be honest with you, sometimes just leaving the profession outright. And so Stephanie talks about the importance of saying yes to yourself and finding um, that those opportunities to create, but also how they can actually lead to helping others. And so she has a really great uh, perspective. She's got some really great ideas on the importance of how we can actually share and build value uh, to create and, and to help others in education, but not to lose ourselves in, in that process. So it's a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos, another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so pumped to have my guest today, Steph Rossi, and she is from the San Jose area. And I asked her a little bit about hockey before this, but uh, that conversation didn't go very far. But um, yeah, it's been great. Steph and I connected. Uh, we've actually connected on Twitter for a long time, and uh, we were connected through a, a mutual podcast that we were both a part of recently. And we had a really great conversation. And so I invited Steph on um, to my podcast because I wanted her to share some of the incredible work that she's doing. And uh, you, you are really going to appreciate not the work that she does, but just the way that she comes across uh, her personality to connect with people is really powerful. So Steph, thank you so much for taking the time um, to be on this podcast, having some conversations with me uh, before. But can you just tell uh, people just a little bit about who you are and just a little bit about what you do in education today? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, as George mentioned, I am Steph Rothstein, and I have too many things to say in my title, so I have to figure out how to shorten that. Uh, currently, I work as a TOSA teacher on special assignment in my school district, and I help teachers with supporting them with educational technology, implementation, pedagogy, and a ton of other things about teaching and implementation. I'm also a Google innovator, coach, and trainer. Um, and I do lots on the side in a variety of areas, but I find myself in lots of education circles. I love to support and help others find their voice and, and just to continue to grow, whether that be both in education and, and connecting that to technology as well. Yeah, and we, we, uh, we're actually, recording this in 2020 but it's gonna go out uh in early 2021 and the reason one of the reasons i want to talk to you is you know you do a ton of support you know for education in you know obviously with technology in 2020 uh probably and and tell me if i'm wrong here there's not a not a huge demand for people like what you do to get hired because they're already in place but probably people were more interested in your schools to actually get access to you. So like how has 2020 been specifically to what you do um, in your role in supporting teachers? My goodness, it's been quite a shift, I would say. Um, and I have heard it uttered not just from me, but from lots of people that are within this same field right, that, um, that there was a ton of work that went into like the year before COVID happened um, in my role and helping just kind of lay the foundation about like what it means to actually connect and connect with students and what it means to implement like good pedagogical practices mm -hmm. and then how, how technology can help support those things and make it a simpler process, an exciting process, an innovative process. And now what I found is people are actually craving it, right? So I chair a design based thinking pathway. And what we always say is that you have to begin with a question and students actually have to feel a need to, to actually want to do the project that you have. And I find the same thing is true for educators. So right now there's a giant need, right? So they have a ton of questions um, and it means that they're seeking out that information. Perhaps prior to this, they didn't feel it was a need. I might've diagnosed it as one, mm -hmm. but they didn't see it because things were going just fine, right? According to plan. And now those plans have had to be thrown out the window and um, 
And now they're like, I have many more people contacting me, asking me to come in from my district, from outside of my district on the internet, saying, can you please come and help and do a presentation or can you provide support in this way? So I think that um, people who are in roles like mine are now being sought after, which is a new space. It's a new space to have people go, um, can you please come or can you talk about this? Can you share about this? Uh, it's a nice place. I, I don't I don't mm -hmm. mind it, um, but it it, it is sad that it took uh, COVID to find value in things that I knew were valuable before. But as with anything, like circumstances then generate true need and true need brings about innovation, right? Like uh, unless you care about it, nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, and you and I have talked about this before. We've been so amazingly impressed like how teachers have been basically doing everything they can to serve students, you know, but I think we also have to acknowledge that teachers do need to take care of themselves, right? You shouldn't For be- sure working like I was reading something about basically um you know teachers being there from like seven to midnight and stuff like that and I, uh, to be honest with you like you, you, you'll, you'll be fine all work will be there for you tomorrow like you're never gonna get done you're never gonna be like oh I I finished <laughs> right like that never <laughs> happens in education right uh it's not like you just you know finish your oh. last assignment you're like I'm done forever all the work's done and new stuff will come there's always stuff to do um, but I think one of the questions, you know, that I've been thinking a lot about, and I think is really important is that when we talk about, you know, a lot of educators kind of saw a need now because they were forced into it, but you and I have maybe seen a need for this a long time ago. And I don't think it's a, and I, I don't ever want to discredit educators. I always put the blame on myself is like, what did I not do previously to yeah. show the value of this before it was necessary, right? Before you had to do it or you wouldn't be able to connect with your students. So as you go into like 2021, like, you know, and you, you have a bunch of people who see this, but now they're talking like, hey, there's vaccines and I don't know like what, what we'll get back to like a, a normal type of school environment if it's ever gonna be like it was in 2019, for example. Uh, but like, how do you ensure that as we go into the next year, we, you know, as people that work in this area, ensure that people still see there is a need for it, even though we might be physically in the same space? Well, I, I think that I, um, if I'm th speaking for myself, when I look back uh, maybe two years ago, I don't know that I was as, um, I don't want to use the word empowered, but uh, as motivated or as emboldened to be able, or as confident maybe is the right word, mm -hmm. to share what I was doing like if I'm going to be really honest, that yeah. I didn't necessarily put my stuff out there. When I was talking to you before this, I was saying, like, I have a ton of content that I did that was just for my school. And I left it unlisted on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and I did the same thing um, in other writings, that it was geared just at the space where, um, where I was working or with the specific teachers that I was working with. And I think what this time has done for me is it's perhaps widened my perspective to go, it is okay to share. It's a great thing to share. And if I if I share out what I'm doing, perhaps it can impact others as I like to read what they're doing. I think many of us continue, like I'm 18 years into to teaching and there are so many of us out there that just go, I, I do my job every day and I'm proud of what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily share it. Um, and perhaps there's a fear of judgment there. Perhaps there's a worry um, about what will happen when you put it out there. And I think other Others, like they work so hard on what they're working on that they're scared about that. Like, just, I'm just going to give it. But I have found that by giving things away, I get so much more in return um, from doing that. I get feedback from people. I learn how they're implementing it. Um, and I think that it has brought about a collaborative, a true community um, that I don't necessarily know that I always have in the spaces where I work. Right. I love yeah. my school. I love where I am, but I think it is different people choosing to work together um, in a space. And that's what comes from putting things out there in like, a, you know, whether it be on Twitter or website or whatever mm -hmm. it might be that then draws other people to you and you find that common space. So that's what I'm hoping for 2021 is more people feeling confident to 
to share what they're doing so that I can keep learning from them and vice versa. Yeah, and there's there's a really great video. Um, I reference it all the time. It's by a gentleman named, I think it's Derek Sivers. I'm, I'm not 100% on the pronunciation, mm. uh, but it's called Obvious to You, Amazing to Others. And it talks mm. about, and I think, you know, as I'm listening to you, kind of you're the prime candidate for where this video is trying to reach is the idea of like the stuff that you just do that you know that's comfortable to you to somebody else in another school another district even another classroom they'd be like wow that i've never even thought of it and i think a lot of times we think about appealing to this mass audience and or you know like maybe even getting criticized for it but really it's if you think about it if you can affect three teachers well that's affecting hundreds of kids you know forever and i think that's a really powerful thing uh, the other thing I've been thinking about, and I think is kind of interesting, uh, you know, I, I, I'm on, I don't know, do you do TikTok? Are you on TikTok at all? I have not. It's got to be, like, a, you have don't, you? Like, look, you don't Are even you? look at it. Okay. My kids, uh, my husband and my kids, like every night, that's what they ask for before <laughs> bed. Can we watch? They watch like 20 minutes of TikTok. So yes, we watch it. I have not created one. It's should well, this be a goal? I don't know. I don't know if it's a goal. It's it's interesting. I'm like really fascinated by it. And I, some of the stuff, uh-huh. so I was a huge Vine guy. I love Vine. And I thought it was like, it was perfect because if a video sucked, it was six seconds. So it's like, eh, whatever, at six seconds, who cares, right? Um, and I think like, it's, it's kind of in that it's a little bit longer. You can have up to minute mm-hmm. videos or some stuff that I just absolutely love, you know, and it's interesting. And I've been really kind of looking like even, you know, the difference between YouTube and TikTok is as soon as you turn on TikTok, there's a video, right? Whereas YouTube, if I go to it, like I'm looking, perusing around what I pick, but it's like, I heard this term recently, the attention economy, right? It immediately Mm -hmm. grabs your attention. And one of the things I find really interesting about TikTok is how quickly um, things go viral. Like I remember Charlie D'Amelio, I remember first seeing her and I'm sure if you know TikTok, you probably know Charlie D'Amelio. She had like 150,000 followers and she went to 250,000. I'm like, that is insane. Like just instantly she got 100,000 followers on TikTok. And now a year later, she's at over hundred million, which is crazy to me. But the reason I bring this up and what this has to do with anything that you're talking about um, with a hundred million followers comes a lot of negative attention as well, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of hatred. And I see some of that. I'm like, yeah, I actually, I don't want to go viral <laughs> anything because I see how some people talk. So I, like, I understand that, that fear of like, mm. what if, what if I do share something really good, it goes viral. And then I was going to get taken apart. Like a lot of times these ideas, uh, you know, ideas are shared and, you know, people just, you want to pick it apart, be, not because of the idea, but because they don't like the person getting the attention. Like if we're, mm. if we're being honest, people are, you know, there's, there's jealousy in all professions and education is, can be included in that. And I think some people are, are nervous about that. But for me, I think if you're, and we talked about this earlier before we got on the podcast, I think if you're focused on providing value, which I know yep. you do a great job of, and I know, and that's like, Hey, can this help somebody? Um, I, I think that's a better route to go than trying to uh, trying to like it's providing value will build a name, but building a name doesn't mean you provide value. If that makes sense. I agree. Sense. Yeah. Right? And that happened, you know, it was interesting this last year, one of the articles that I ended up writing and then a p- the part of it just kept like people kept commenting on it in, in a good way. So luckily it was, it has been right. positive, but I, but I was writing about this was, back in June, I think, um, about the, my own takeaways from being virtual and the things that I will continue to do even when we go back. Um, who, who knew then that it would continue for as long as it has. But one of the things that I, that I learned about was that I needed a system, I needed a way when I'm alone in a classroom and especially virtual to have students be the people helping me during during that live discussion, whether it be on Meet or Teams or Zoom, right? That that somehow when we're together, I need students having jobs. And so I had observed so many teachers in the real classroom utilizing student jobs that then I developed having student jobs in my own and I came up with five. And those 
those five, all of a sudden people started like commenting. Then I had to make a visual that went with like, that right. became the thing that people just kept asking about. Cause I started to have somebody who was, um, but it came out of a need, right? Like I needed somebody, I was alone. When, if kids would pop in late, I wanted a kid to be a welcomer, a greeter to them to say welcome and to catch them up on what we'd done and to let them know that their voice was valid. And I needed somebody to be a linker for when I give out links so that I don't have to keep like worrying about all those things, right? I like came up with things that I'm like, if I could have like 10 TAs, what would they do? So here I'm gonna have students who take on these roles each class and it's been wonderful. And now I don't even have to give out the roles. Now the kids just know, like they all just help each other. Right. Yeah. But like, you know, I'm in high school, but they, they need something. And then it made them feel part of a community. So I just think, uh, but it was a thing I was already doing. I was doing mm -hmm. it for me. And so to me, putting it out there, it wasn't something where I thought like, oh, this is going to be any sort of an epiphany. But I, I, because as you mentioned to me, it was, it was obvious to me, it was a thing I needed. Right. And as soon as I put it out there, I went like, oh, it was a thing that was obvious to me, but maybe it wasn't wider, or maybe it was obvious to me because I had come to it after like scratching my head for so long. Um, and then I was so happy when I did. So I'm glad more and more that I'm realizing that it is good to share and good to share my voice and good to put it out there in writing as well. Um, and that that can connect with people. Yeah. And uh, like, I think and I, this is another thing I've been thinking about quite a bit is that we always talk about student voice, but we don't talk about like student listening, right? We don't like yeah. teach kids how to actively listen. And I think that it is very imperative um, that we are, are great learners and 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 kind of mold our ideas and take time before we share them and things like that. And one of the things I actually noticed about you, and I don't, it's in this podcast, I actually noticed. We we said, hey, I told you, I'm like, hey, we're gonna talk a little bit uh, before. I just wanna kind of like learn some stuff about you before we record on a podcast. You know, it's a good way to kind of get warmed up before you, you share the ideas. But you like literally like had a book with you and I like shared something and you're writing down ideas. I saw that when you actually referenced that video um, that you, you wrote down, I mentioned that video, you wrote it down. I noticed that you looked to the side, um, when he did it. And one of the things that I really appreciate about your work is like how, how, like, I, I don't even say like obsessed, but you are like an incredible learner, right? And you, you're always kind of thinking you're absorbing ideas. One of the things I used to talk about when I look for people that I hired in my schools was I look for a sponge factor. I, I look for like, is this person going to try to like, it, it wants to be in a space where they learn, take in new ideas and then try new things. Or are they like coming there and saying, this is the way things are. This is how they'll always be and move. So like, how is this something that's natural for you? Or is this something you've actually developed? And they're like, if you've developed it or like, how did you get to that point where you are like so focused on being such a good learner? Oh gosh, I love that question so much. Um, I would say it the the writing things down has um, come over the last year, maybe year and a half. Um, as a Google innovator, my mentor, Natasha Rachel, she's amazing. Um, and whenever we would meet, she had a notebook and mm -hmm. she would write down things. And at the end of our sessions together, um, she would say to me, all right, what are your three goals? And so every time we would meet, I, like I had to have three at the end of it. And what I took away from my time with her were all of those goals and the fact like how focused she was able to be because she really did hear me. So I started to, I do, part of my job is also mentoring um, new teachers. Uh, I also have a student teacher this year. So I find my role is I'm taking lots of notes and lots of what you're doing in kind of this in-between teacher leader role is observation. And if I really am going to be a good observer, I need to observe and actually see what people are doing. And I find that I have taken that from the classroom mm -hmm. to be just in my life. I'm always somebody like, if, if you're gonna tell me something, I wanna go read about it. I wanna research what else has happened. Um, it goes with like my personality type for sure that I'll like find 25 articles about it before we talk. Um, because I just wanna know, is it worthy of my time? Is it worthy of a conversation? Is it worthy of me delving deep on it? Um, and so if I, I'm gonna share it with you, it means that I 
I think it is. I also think so much comes when you were talking about the listening piece. And so that's why like part, like the first lessons that we do in the pathway that I chair, like for design thinking, it all is rooted in empathetic listening, right? So everything that we do is how do you actually listen and learn from other people? And it's why I started doing the, the stuff around, can we talk? Because it, it helps people to learn how to approach other people and then when they share how to really listen so that like it, it's an area of focus for me for sure you know in the the one thing that a little behind the scenes of the podcast i think has really helped me is a lot of people say like hey you're gonna send me questions like i'm like nope <laughs> i'm just gonna i'm gonna ask you a question and then we're going to just talk about it yeah. And I think the reason why that's important is because, and I'm not saying I wouldn't do this. Well, actually, maybe I, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't do it naturally. Right. But I find when it's like, you have like five questions put out, you might just not be even listening to the answers. You might be just get waiting till go on to the next question. Whereas I'm trying to like say, okay, I want it. I'm shooting for like 30 to 45 minutes for a podcast with literally no questions. And it's going to be important that I build on what the person is saying to me. And I think that just having the podcast has actually helped me become a better listener in some ways. Now, it doesn't mean I don't talk and obviously I can blab on forever, but I think that's a, a really good point. And, you know, kind of like, how do we absorb that information? And um, I, I, when I looked at, you know, I, I was looking at your website, things before we got on here and you, you mentioned this, the Can We Talk initiative. Can mm -hmm. you tell people what that is? Um, and, and really kind of what is that doing in education? What's the, what's the goal of that? Sure. It came out of um, my classroom. So as I mentioned, um, I've been, I, I've been teaching 18 years and I have done this in my classroom for all of those. And even before when I was in college. So I was first introduced to personality assessments when I was at UC Berkeley. Um, and I had, I, was at a job where they made us take that super long Myers-Briggs assessment. Yeah. Um, and it was like the 500 question one. And a conversation with my boss at the time totally shifted me. Um, I was in a position where I was running all of the orientation, um, all of the orientation staff. And like when freshmen would come in for their orientation and transfer students, and I had to be in a position of leadership. It was probably like one of the first true times of being in a role. I mean, I was also a student there, but where it was a real role of leadership. And when I took that, um, I scored on that one, like almost a hundred percent in the F on the feelings area. Mm -hmm. And my boss at the time, Patrick, he, he said to me, he's like, look, this is fine for you in your personal life and you can be whoever you need to be, but I need you to be able to be okay with re receiving feedback and where you are. And something about that, that conversation, um, really did impact me wanting to look more deeply at personality and learning style. So after that, um, I think I made a conscious effort to go. I know. And so I started to look at what are ways that I can do that. And that's what brought me to research and looking at that. And then when I was in the classroom, I wanted to look for a way to actually use this to understand students. So that's really where Can We Talk came from, is that um, I found the it's an offshoot similar to Myers-Briggs, but it's a shorter survey mm -hmm. called the True Color Survey. It's from Ketterman from 1972. And, um, and I've been using it forever. It's a, you can find it on the internet. It's a paper survey. So I often, I give this survey, it splits kids into four colors or, or not just students, but anybody can take it. My own children have my husband, right? So you're either a gold, green, blue, or, or an orange. And depending on those, um, it then aligns with a bit about who you are, your learning style, um, and how you gravitate maybe towards people or learning or understanding. Um, and what I help students do is we, we take it. So I've digitized the form. You can download it off of the website. And I've also given educators who want to implement it, whether it be with staff or with students, a way to actually use the data. So they can download it, they can use it. And then there are activities and things that you can do. Because that's stuff that I actually really dislike. And I, you know, I tend to approach things really positively, but I dislike when we do all of these like opening 
things and like getting to know you stuff and then it just disappears. Like that for me feels meaningless. And if we're going to do something where we're actually connecting with people, I want it to be a value. So what I tried to do was support with like, what are activities? What are things that you can do um, at, at every unit, at every unit break for teams to get to know each other that is rooted in this initial piece. So I use it when I'm building groups. I help to build balanced teams. I have students reflect on why they're in that group, how they bring value to the team, how they would like to be approached, how they want other students to approach them, um, the way to actually listen and learn from each other. Like it informs all of our practices. We analyze literature based on it. The science teachers that I work with analyze, like one of them is a chemistry teacher and she has the students analyze the colors of the elements, right? So like just starting to look at, okay, is this, is this um, a more social element? Does it like to attach on to others, right? Um, or is it someone that, that need, is it an element that like structure? So, right, it aligns itself with these personality types. Um, and then that's brought me to building out these kind of growth challenges that are by month um, to help both students and anybody else using it to really think about it, ways of growth. So when I talked about my boss, Patrick, who like talked to me about an area of growth, like I think we often need a way to know what are ways where we can get better? It doesn't mean that what we have is a fault. It just means what can I learn from the other learning styles or personality types that can help me be a stronger, more connected, more collaborative individual, right? Like, and so how can I learn from others to be my best self? Where, um, so if, if people wanted to find out more about that, it, yeah. where, where, could, where could they go for that specific So program? you go to canwetalkedu.com. And it has all the resources right now. They're in the front page has a bunch of things. So you could like take the, you could take the, the learning styles assessment right there on the front page. It's got a bunch of resources for you. I've recorded things that you can use in your classroom, like using Pear Deck, Nearpod and slides with my voice on it, if you wanna guide students through it. Um, and then um, there's a whole resources page that's in English. There's a Spanish version and an Italian version as well. Um, and go. we're hoping to have some other languages too. Yeah, so, so it's being implemented right now in a variety of schools and districts. Um, and that's been super exciting to hear feedback from people. So that's interesting. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of that, but um, for anyone yeah. listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube, just check the links below. We've linked it too, so you can have direct access to that because it sounds great. And one thing that I found really interesting and you kind of, I don't know, maybe, and maybe this is my own, maybe I picked it up because I was looking for it, um, was I was thinking about like icebreakers and how much I despise them as a teacher as a human being maybe uh how I, I it's like it's almost like hey let's everyone make everyone feel super uncomfortable and like i i kind of feel like th there's great ways to build relationships in organic ways throughout the day and i was thinking about that um because i often see how much people hate them yet we continue to do them too often in education I, and yeah Steph, it's true I'm, okay so it's not just me right yeah. no no I, it's not just you <laughs> So, so I just kind of thinking about that. And I was thinking about how that, you know, kind of understand the personalities with students. And I don't know if you have any, you know, um, uh, experience with this, uh, connected to the, can we talk program, but the, one of the big conversations is like, oh, kids have to have their cameras on, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, maybe you feel comfortable with the camera on, but maybe they don't want to turn the camera on, right? And it's like, maybe they don't want to do to see their bedroom or their room that they're in right. or their house or anything like that. Maybe they just don't want to be on camera. And it's like, it's kind of, you know, and we're, it's kind of, I, I kind of connected it to the icebreaker idea because like, maybe you like icebreakers, but don't force them on everyone else. And I'm thinking well, that's kind of like what we do with cameras. Right. And I understand, uh, you know, people it's hard. Like I, I wouldn't want to, to do a, a session and everyone's cameras off except for mine. Cause then you have that feeling that you're not there. But I think a lot of people just turn them on because they feel comfortable doing that. And some people turn them off because that's what they feel comfortable with. So I don't know if there's mm -hmm. any connection between that and how we're doing like, you know, virtual stuff with our students and, you know, the cameras, is there any connection to that? 
You know, it's interesting. I, I would say providing opportunities, like one of the things I started to think about was providing opportunities for students to not be forced into that like uncomfortable space mm -hmm. that I wouldn't want to be in myself when I'm like, I teach ninth grade. So they're, for, they're coming to a new school, right. um, they're meeting kids and they're doing it in a pandemic and it's crazy. So so for mine, a lot of it was we did them um, where they made they made a slide that then it had like the color either like they chose there's a slide that's already provided that's on there. So let's say they're green, there was a green notebook they could pick from, a green phone case, a green um, water bottle, and then they would pull that onto their slide and they decorate it with stickers that help tell them something about themselves. They'd add pictures to it and then they recorded a flip grid. And mm -hmm. what that allowed was they could record that Flipgrid picture on or not, right? Now that's an option. They could put whatever pictures they wanted, whatever stickers they wanted. It wasn't like I gave them a, a bunch of options on um, on a, of a list of, you know, 20 different questions that could maybe help prompt them. But I said that they were welcome to share whatever they would want others to know about mm -hmm. them and getting to know them. And then before we met in groups, the prompt was that everybody in that group watched each other's. And what I found was when we did it small, like what I dislike most about those icebreakers is when we do it really large, like I, I worry mm -hmm. about those students where it's already uncomfortable. So then I moved them into groups, like I had purposefully put them in groups where I tried to balance the personality types even before we got in there. So then they watched each other's and then I asked them a question like, why do you think I put you four together? And then they, they talked about that and they, they each brought up their personality types, cameras on or off. It didn't matter to me, but I think more felt like they could turn it on because they had already seen each other in the previous video. Like there was a safety to that. Um, when they came back to the big session, I don't know that everybody had it on yet. We've now built a safety in that room mm -hmm. where more and more students feel like they can. But I would say for me, that's not my focus. I just want to know that a student's there. Like if I call, if I say something, are you writing in the right. chat? Are you able to respond? Are you hearing me? Are we connected? And whether that be with a camera or not, like I, I for me, I cannot spend my time being that teacher that is like, I'm going to nitpick each of these right. little, like, like, I just want to know that you're okay and that we're learning together. And like, if, if we're good with both of those things, camera on or not, then we're fine, you know? And we have students that live here that they, they're they in the, the mountains. If they put their camera on, it's gonna pull on the internet. Like right. they can't do it. So like, who am I to say that they need it? I just wanna know you're all right. So as long as we're good, we're good. You know, yeah, that's pretty speaking, much my Speaking plus. of uh, Flipgrid, I actually noticed, yeah. I don't know if you saw this, um, was they actually went, and because if you don't use Flipgrid, it's basically yeah. people record little videos talking about whatever, but they actually did like an audio only version. I don't know if you just yeah. saw that. Yeah, it just came really... out. I think it was like two or three days ago, right? Yeah, and well, I, I just well, saw well. it online. I thought it was really good that they're kind of honoring that too, because maybe I don't want you to see my face. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm, you know, I think there's a lot of times in my life, like, I don't really feel comfortable on camera. I actually saw, um, <laughs> and I felt this. Uh, I, I can't remember what comedian it was, but it was just like, have you ever seen a picture of yourself and it ruined your whole day? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. That's, I was like, that, yeah, I have. I've literally, that is literally, I've seen myself. I'm like, oh, that's what I look like. You know, and you just kind of have those moments mm -hmm. and then you feel kind of insecure. And then you're like, but everyone turned your camera on. I'm like, okay, well, that's, it, it might just not be their day. Like people just might not be feeling that today. And I understand that. And so in addition, it, just, it made me think about um, voice a lot too, when you're talking about really listening, Yeah. like there might be a time when it's more powerful to have the camera right. off and it really then makes us listen. Like we really are listening to what you have to say. Yeah. yeah and so the majority, think, the ma and that you prove a point of people listening to this podcast, the majority of people are, even though I post this also on YouTube, the majority of people are listening to it on a uh, podcast, right? They're listening on, on iTunes or Spotify or SoundCloud, mm -hmm. right? because that's just what they prefer. They might have in the background, they might be intently listening, writing notes, but uh, you know, it's not like we're doing all these like crazy uh, PowerPoint <laughs> transitions right. that they're like, oh, I can't wait to see that even though those are the worst things ever. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the last thing I wanna ask you out is uh, you actually had a TEDx talk and it's actually on the TED website, which is pretty, a pretty big deal, right? 
like that that's 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 big time um, i was pretty excited yeah yeah that's congratulations that, that's that's really awesome and it's um the title of it i think uh i i think i have this written down is my year of yes yeah my correct? year of yes to me my year of yes to me okay so yeah tell tell me more about that okay so um at this point in time now looking back this would be about two years ago um i decided to embark on what i what I branded, what I called my year of yes to me. And the talk basically goes through me coming home and asking my husband and my three kids if it was okay that I stopped waiting on certain things that I wanted to pursue in my life. And could I take some time out for me and stop putting myself and my some of my bigger dreams professionally um, on the back burner? And is it okay that I take time out? Cause it, you know, it's a lot being, um, I, I love my family, but it meant that it was going to, to sacrifice some time with them, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. I wanted to just say like, are you okay with supporting me on that journey? And right away they said yes. And so my talk really was about how did I approach that? Um, that I chair a pathway that's um, since it's design thinking, it's all about pushing students and asking them to leap and take giant steps forward and to risk take, but that I had all of these ideas and dreams and was I really modeling it? Was I risk taking? Was I putting myself out there? And the talk basically is me saying, if I'm honest, no, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to take a year to do it. Um, and that year has become longer now that I'm more comfortable with it. Uh, and so the, so I talked about the process of actually leaping, what it took, what I realized I needed to do, and that it breaks it down into four parts. And the first part is actually making room on your plate. So letting certain things go so that you actually have room to do the things that are next. Um, and part of what I came to learn that I think was one of my biggest epiphanies before that talk was I listened to Diane Bryant speak. She was the former CEO of Google Cloud. I went to a, I was invited by a, a parent of a student um, and I became very close with the parent um, to a women's leadership luncheon. She just said like one day, she's like, I, I want you to come to this. I think it would be really great. And when I was hearing Diane talk, one of the things that she talked about was that women often wait um, to pursue in general. She talked about the idea of like when she would look at women's resumes that they had waited longer. And it was, it was then when I was hearing her and I just kept going like, oh my gosh, she's talking to me. She's totally talking to me. And I kept doing that. I would sell myself short or I'd talk myself out of it. And so I talked a lot about that, that inner voice that just kept saying like, are you ready? Are you sure? Are you worthy of it? I don't know. And that that had been stopping me for at the time, like 16, 17 years. And even when I went to go do other things, right? Like my admin credential, I was doing that at, after like 17 or 18 years of teaching. And I'm looking around at people that have been teaching like three, four, five years in these programs. And I'm going like, did I wait too long? Like, why did I wait? What was stopping me? Was it my, was I stopping myself? And I probably was. And that each of the experiences that I had had in my life um, had been because someone shoulder tapped me and said, I think you're ready. I think you're worthy of this. And that I wanted to learn how to shoulder tap myself and say, I am ready. I know I am. And what do I want to pursue? And that I wanted to stop being somebody waiting for somebody else to tell me I was worthy. Um, and so it really was like the, the year of yes, of going like, um, sorry for that extra noise, of going, what are, what are my biggest leaps? What do I want to do? And so then I specifically talked about um, pursuing Google Innovator, applying for that and taking that giant leap. Um, and that led me to going to Singapore, meeting tons of people, um, doing things like this, um, standing on a stage stage and doing a TEDx talk, like it, it helped me once I did it once, mm -hmm. it helped me to go, I can keep doing this and I can keep modeling it. I can keep putting things out there. Uh, and that I didn't, I think I needed more validation before I felt like I could do it. And I wanted to learn how to not need that validation to take my next steps. So like a um, little bit, and I, and I love what you're saying. I think it's so important. And there's a couple of things. Um, that I think about if for me, I, I really try to make sure that I find time in my day to do things that 
provide me purpose and help me take care of myself. And so like, I always carve time out to work out every day. Um, Mm -hmm. I carve out time to work on things that are, you know, really purposeful to me. And I know how hard that can be to say like, Hey, I'm not spending this time with my kids. I'm not doing this, but I think it's better to spend, um, you know, a couple hours less with my kids, but I'm happy than to be with them all the time and be miserable. Right. You don't want 24 hours of George being miserable. It's not good. It's not good for me. It's not good for my kids. Right. And I think that's part of it. Now, of course you get, you might get tired and stuff like that, but I find like working out gives me more energy to like be with my kids and like little things like that. And I think that's part of it is, um, is kind of having that, you know, when your time might be less, but is it better? And I think that's a question Mm -hmm. that I always ask when I think about this. Um, but there's, you remind me of a story and I've shared this before and I just love it. Uh, they were talking, I, I don't know if it's a true story or it's just like an internet meme story. Uh, but it was like a, a young woman had shared uh, that when she was 19 years old, that she was talking to her mom and she said, want to be a doctor, but she didn't, she didn't know if it was a good idea because she wouldn't be done till she was 30 years old. And her mom said, well, you're going to be 30 anyway, so you might as well be a doctor. Right. And I just love that. I love that story. I just think mm. it's really powerful because we put this off. We put things off. Mm. You're going to five years from now is going to be five years from now. What do you want change within that five years? And I think it's a, a really powerful story. And so I, I love that. And so um, again, we're going to link the, to, to Steph's said talk there, my year of yes to watch the whole thing, but uh, I appreciate you sharing that. So because this is being recorded in 2020, uh, but it's being shared in 2021. Uh, w- so my, my hope is that I hope I'm not regretting saying this because I thought we were only going to quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> so that longest two weeks right? ever, <laughs> but, uh, I think vaccines actually just were released in the United States today. Uh, they've been in Canada, you know, for a little bit longer because, you know, Canada is always a little bit ahead. Love Canada, man. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. It's whatever. No, the let's, there's another reason. Earlier. No, no, there's another, like, I love Canada. I, I, you don't know it about me, but I've been a type one diabetic since I was six years old yeah. on an insulin pump. So like, I have to love Canada cause you know, you, you made insulin. So that's Canada. I love that. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Just make, it must, yeah. It must you, you got like, be, you know, like you can't really do anything in winter cause it's so cold. So you just invent, just invent maybe. insulin maybe. Right. Yeah. Um, Okay, so 2021, let's say uh, we're getting back to somewhat normal. What's something that you look forward to doing in 2021? Oh, gosh. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I miss, honestly, like something with my family, and then I'll talk about like education too. So it it doesn't have to be anything to do with education. With my family, I. I absolutely, like we are amusement park people, like to our core, like we love as a family going, like even our youngest, our, like our, when she was two, like she was already going on roller coasters. Like we love it all. I met your daughter today and she's wearing a Mickey Mouse sweater. She was. Okay. And I, I miss it. Like I, like I live at our local theme parks. Um, I, I like as a, a mom, cause we always would call it in the summer. It was called camp mommy. Cause I, you know, I work hard during the school year and then yeah. during the summer I'm home and it's camp mommy and it has been camp mommy now for like 10 months. So that I think is, um, that's been a challenge. So I want, I want like the real camp mommy to come back. And I want to be able to go to my local amusement park where I can have my food passes and mommy doesn't have to cook. And we go there for like all of our meals of the day. We ride rides, kids go on roller coasters. It's joyful. Like I'm surrounded with like happy screaming and noise. And then we come home and everybody's so tired. They just like pass out in bed. Like I miss, I miss that. Um, Cause I haven't gone outside a lot um, to be honest with you. I, uh, and I, I just, I miss that. I miss like getting out and doing, doing those kinds of adventurous things together. Um, and now the girls keep saying every time they measure themselves, they're like, I'm taller, I'm tall enough to go on and they'll name a ride. Like that's how we measure stuff in our house is like, you're it. tall enough. And so our youngest is now tall enough to go on some of the big kid rides. That's so awesome. uh, we're waiting on that. Yeah. Um, so you have the, and then, like, yeah. you, 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 you could ride this you like stole one yes. of those signs from Disneyland and you just have it in your house all the time. Oh gosh, that would be so good. No, we just good. have tape on the door. I totally should. <laughs> you should just oh. steal a sign. 
Maybe yeah, you know, goal for life. That's that's okay. a 2020 thing, right? <laughs> you might as well make yeah. an amusement park in your house. You know, I'd feel so guilty. I'd probably make it though. I could commission somebody <laughs> oh, to yeah. make it. There's, there's got to um, be yeah. on Etsy. Somebody will make that for you. Somebody will make it for me. You're right. Like <laughs> nice Canada, metal sign. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, and then I would say big goals for education might be to finally like start to put some of the things that I've been thinking about down in in writing more regularly. Book form, perhaps, maybe. perhaps a book. Perhaps a book. Yeah, That'd be great. that would be a dream for sure. Well, you know the the year of yes keeps keeps going and going. So this is the last question I'm going to ask you. And I was thinking about this as you were talking. So this wasn't my. I actually that was supposed to be the last question, but this last question. Okay, so 2020 is like totally sucked, right? Um, it's been a tough year, but I look at like what what is like a habit or something that you will continue that you got from this year? Like, is there anything you're like, you know what? I didn't do this before, and now because it's 2020, I do this, but I'm 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 staying with that. You know, it's a really good question. I, I think I would actually say I wasn't as connected. Um, like on Twitter, social mm -hmm. media with a, with a true PLN that I would consider like a, a family of people that I could go to at any hour of the day, because we're all over the world. So no matter what, I could like post something and yeah. somebody's going to write me back. I did not do that as, as regularly, as often as I have over this last year. And it has changed me as a person and I am eternally grateful for it. So that will forever continue. Well, yeah. with that, make sure that you follow Steph on uh, Twitter. What is what's your what's your Twitter handle? It's okay Steph. at the moment. At it's, the moment. At the moment, because according to George, I need to change it. It's <laughs> at Steph underscore EdTech, and um and I yeah maybe maybe we could talk. Maybe people can give me feedback. But uh yeah, I'm gonna look at what will help broaden me out there because I do a lot more than ed tech but it is a passion for sure um, and, that, and, and that's so what we i appreciate that feedback that, that's why we talked is because yeah. um i've connected with stephanie been reading her stuff and i'm like ed tech is like a component right there's yeah. so much that yeah. you do and i think that somewhat i actually I, i'm gonna start a, a tv show called twitter makeover <laughs> Because I always like just that go is so say, like, good. You should change your Twitter handle to this, right? Because I just I, I yeah. feel like there's so much you do that I, I, I you know that's so you know um, powerful that goes beyond educational technology, like the the stuff that you're doing, really empowering student voice, empowering uh, voice, you know, talking about developing your own leadership, uh, self care, things like that. I think that you're not you know educational technology now. It, it's not as simple as just changing it to whatever you want because there's only one Steph uh, underscore EdTech. But I, I think, you know, Twitter makeover 2021, maybe that's the, the new TV show I should start. Oh my, I'm seriously, I'm into this show idea, George. Like yeah. I would help you with that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Can okay, I be, well, a, can I like be a background producer? Yeah, you might be, okay. you, I, well, like I think that you, you might be the Our first, first person, the first on, it. person okay. on there, right? Sure. You just do a whole thing. Yeah. So then like, yeah. a big, like big we room. can model it after HGTV's extreme home makeover. So this would be an extreme, right? Like in Canada, yeah. those uh, twin guys, right? I don't know how much. HGTV oh, I watch them all. Yes, I do. Canadian. I, do. I great. think a lot of those shows are actually Canadian, right? So many, so many. <laughs> I could uh, list all the shows. We won't do that today. Okay. <laughs> okay I appreciate that. So, Hey, Steph, make sure um, you can find Steph's details to her website, TED Talk, um, a lot of things that you share and, and connect with her on Twitter. It was awesome to talk to you. And I think one of the things that I appreciate, you talked about how valuable it's been that you uh, have connected and grown as a person because of your connections on Twitter. But I also think, and I'll say this, you know, as someone who's done this, I think you connecting more has made other people better as well. And it's one of the reasons I want to talk to you. So I really appreciate your time. Uh, make sure you follow Steph on uh, Twitter and connect with her. Uh, the details are down below. Steph, thanks for having me today and for being on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. So Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.